It's just us again, Sarah. Are you ready? Dun, dun. I am ready. Don't call the cops this time. They don't need to know. About what? <laughs> it's just me and you. <laughs> it's just me and you. <laughs> Oh my god. Do you know what I thought of the other day that I haven't thought of in fucking forever? What? That damn barn that used to be down by your house, like the old slaughterhouse barn oh. that had no floor yeah. in it. Oh god. Hold on a second. I have to beat my cat. Myathan. <laughs> Get out of there. Get out of there. Apparently there's something in the water with black cats today. He keeps on um, eating cords, and he just got near my uh, 1992 uh, Magna box. <laughs> <laughs> if that goes, I'm not getting another one. Yeah, yeah, no, that's not happening. No, I mean, Salem's been on this fucking binger today of just going after any plastic that she could find, and then she got all super cuddly with me. I was like, okay. Maybe we're just having a bad day. Maybe things are going wrong. And as she's sitting there, I got my headphones in. She, like, leans over, stretches her neck out as far as she fucking can, and bites down on my headphone wire. I'm like, are you shitting me? I thought you wanted also, cuddles. This is not what this was. They're committing crimes. They are committing crimes. It was a fucking plot of evil. It's like, you want to listen to Skyrim music while you're doing your research? I think not. That's not allowed. You can't have anything. I thought you knew that. This is why we can't have <laughs> nice things. It's also part of the reason why I'm like, hmm, what things can I do in my house to keep my wires out of Salem's way? So, if anyone has any ideas on that factor, I'd be happy to hear them. <laughs> because she... You can try... She's a monster when it comes to wires. My laptop charger, I have had to replace four times because of her. I just, like, I see the little, I summon the cats going over there. <laughs> He's like, no, I just want to eat your wires, Mom. He got oh, out. there he goes. <laughs> oh, it's Margo? Yeah. Hell yeah. Yeah. My little cuddle buddy. Oh. She says that oh, we're we're on the computer. We are on the computer. Time to do computer stuff with mom. Yes. But yeah, no, today okay. I was definitely like, for some reason, the fucking barn Girl. by your house in fucking Fort Collins years ago kept popping into brain. I was like, what the fuck? <laughs> Maybe it's because I fell Didn't... down there and then I had to oh, climb God. my ass back out. Oh god. Didn't we used to say that there were, like, Slendermen over there? Yeah. <laughs> the Slender Barn. <laughs> the Slender Barn. I just the remember I, barn. I was walking with you, and I went to go, like, check inside, because I was like, I want to see what it looks oh. like inside. And you're like, oh. oh, by the way, there's no floor, and you didn't say it fast enough. <laughs> I yeah. fell. <laughs> so, um... One of the, the kids we were in theater with, he um, he went in there and um, he went up uh, up somewhere and he said that the floor was just human excrement. Ew. Yeah, I, that was like a few years after we went. Yeah, but... I was going to say, I'm like, that sounds like years after because that wasn't what it was like in there when I went in. Yeah, no, uh, people started living in it. <laughs> that, I guess. That matches up for Fort Collins, yeah. Yeah. That was gross. Yuck. I'm sure it's still there. Yeah, it probably is. I can message somebody people that lives take... over there. <laughs> I'm sure people are still taking, like, family photos there. Meanwhile, there's, like, some guy upstairs in a pile of poop, like, overdosing. Oh, God. Like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, before we get started, while we understand some individuals listen for the entertainment aspect of true crime it's important to remember that these are real people with families and friends who may still be suffering from their loss these stories are not meant to open old wounds or cause further emotional damage to those involved we remind you to please be respectful and do not dox or contact those involved with cases 
The case discussed on this podcast today may be disturbing to some audience members and listener discretion is advised. No trigger warnings from what I know. I just finished doing all this, so I don't think we have any. Um, we are continuing bodies. with the bodies of Everest from last week. So if you haven't watched or listened to part one, please make sure to go back and do that because it has key information going forward of whereabouts we are on Mount Everest, along with our first set of human remains on the mountain, George Mallory and Andrew Irving. So we're going to start today with one Hannelore Schmatz. In 1979, Hannelore and her husband, Gerard Schmatz, were planning on going up Everest. The year prior to attempting their Everest summit, they would actually climb a mountain each year. Their confidence to take on Everest was rising with each successful climb and expedition on Earth's tallest mountaintops. They went ahead and conquered Montezuma in 1973. And to prepare for Everest, like I said, they were conquering a new mountain every year until 1979 when they decided that it was time and they were capable enough to summit Everest. Gerard described Hanalore as a genius when it came to sourcing and transporting expedition materials while he was in charge of logistics and more technical aspects of the climb. With their equipment at the ready, along with six other professional climbers at their side, Hanalor and Gerard set out to summit Everest in July of 1979. They reached the South Coal Camp on September 20, uh, 24th and set up for the last high camp of their trek. However, a days-long blizzard forced them back down the mountain for safety reasons. During their second ascent, the couple split up, with Gerard's group going first and making it to the South Coal first, and they began to journey to Everest Peak. And by October 1st, the group had actually reached the summit. However, they were forced back down rapidly due to worsening weather conditions, and descending groups warned Hanalore and her team that it would be too dangerous to continue. However, Hanalore forged ahead the next day at 5 a.m. And as Gerard arrived back at the base camp at 6 p.m., he was alerted that his wife had actually made it to the summit. Unfortunately, though, during the descent, Hanalor and an American climber, Ray Gennett, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that last name, were both overcome with exhaustion. Their accompanying Sherpas warned them against taking refuge, but they built a bivouac camp and took shelter anyway. However, the shelter was still set up in the death zone. Ray died first of hypothermia, which led Hanalore and the two accompanying Sherpas to frantically attempt their descent to a safer camp further down the mountain. Tragically, though, the unforgiving environment had already taken its toll on Hanalore's body. It was already shutting down. And she sat down with no more energy to spare. Her last words were, water, water before she slumped back against her backpack and died. In 1981, the leader of an American medical expedition to the top of Mount Everest discovered the body of Hanalor embedded in the ice and on the upper slopes of the world's highest mountain. Now, we're gonna pronounce names.com this because <laughs> I didn't have time to come back through. Yeah. And that is definitely it's it's American, but it is not American at the same time. It's Worcestershire, isn't it? <laughs> it is kind of Worcestershire. So Chris Kipchemski, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that, stated that we did not touch it. I could see she still had her watch on. He did go on to state how for a while he thought that what he was actually seeing was a tent embedded in the ice. However, upon getting a closer look, he did realize that it was a woman. In 1984, two experienced Nepalese climbers died on the mountain trying to recover the body of Hanalor. The bodies of Nepalese police inspector, one, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounce this, Yongendra Bahadi Tapa, I'm so sorry once again, it's not my native language, 
was 36 years old and his partner Agni Dorhi was 35 years old when they were found on the mountain. They'd fallen and had become entangled in their ropes below Hanalore's body. One day after they set out from the mountain's main pass. Sometime after this, a powerful gust of wind pushed Hanalore's body and it tumbled over the Kangxing face where it disappeared from sight and it possibly forever into the mountainscape. Hanalore was the first German climber as well as the first woman to perish on Mount Everest slopes. Next up, we have Marty Hoy. And this one kind of messed with me a little bit because I clicked on her name when going through a list of individuals that are on Everest, just out of curiosity. And her story just breaks my heart. So let's get into it. Marty Hoy was a charismatic, fun-loving person who valued ethics and integrity. She loved horses and literature, was a warm and engaging person with a keen intellect. However, she was not acting superior or condescending towards others with that intellect. According to friends and family, she could be friends with basically anyone, and they didn't think that she had a single enemy in the world. In the mountains, Marty was a very focused and highly professional, hardworking climber, both in her craft and as a guide for others moving forward. Marty was a remarkable, fast, and strong climber who quickly dispelled any macho notions that women can't meet the same standards to beat their male counterparts in climbing. She was determined to perform well on Everest. So this group is taking the North Ridge, and on March 21st, they reach the base camp. Then after acclimating for some time there, they take their equipment up to advanced base camp by yaks. From here, the group spent three weeks carrying loads up the glacier to Camp 1 and Camp 2 at the foot of the massive north face. On April 8th, the real climbing began, and rather than taking the direct route up the face with an unacceptable level of an avalanche hazard from a large ice cliff standing at roughly 24,000 feet, the group opted for a less direct approach and took a path alongside a ice fall beneath the steep flanks of the Changsti. From here, the group established a camp on the North Face proper, just above 6,705 meters. The camp was at the base of a Sarek, which offered protection from avalanches off the face above. After days of effort, on April 18th, a route was established to Camp 4, and several attempts were made to fully establish it in a rocky moat at the base of the Great Collier, which is a steep gully high on the north face of the mountain and extends about 150 meters below the summit. Finally, on May 15th, the group was prepared to try a summit attempt. The first team consisted of Marty Hoy, Larry Nielsen, and James Wickwire. And David Mahar was running support from, uh, for the group from a distance. And I'm so sorry if I mispronounced his last name. They climbed up the hard snow and occasionally icy patched ground of the Collier. Larry and David searched for a campsite around 26,300 feet. While Mary and James waited 200 feet below in the collier on the only reasonably sized rock around. In James's writing, he recalls at 5.30 p.m., he started to carry a section of rope to the lead pair. And then suddenly, without warning, he recalls hearing a sudden ping, turning around to see Mary pitching backwards, head down on the icy slope. He then recalls yelling at her to grab the rope. She went sliding head first, managed to roll to her side, and made a valiant attempt to grab the fixed rope. However, she slid right past it. She was only visible for the first few hundred feet of the fall, but disappeared oh into God. the mist and clouds that clung to the face. Oh, 
That's terrifying. James recalls that at not one point did she cry out, which I imagine you couldn't at that point. You were just so shell shocked that this is happening that you were just in freeze mode because there's absolutely nothing else you can do. You can't fight or flight. It's freeze. What is it? Your brain starts like frantically searching for like what to do. Mm hmm. Yeah, that's what mine would be doing in that situation. I'd be like, what do I do? What do I do? And then once you hit the free fall, I can imagine that it's still searching. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So at this point, James then looks at the anchor where Marty's waist harness and Jamar are still attached to the fixed rope. Somehow the buckle had suddenly unfastened when she leaned back on her Jamar. And without an ice axe embedded in the hard snow to anchor her, she had no chance to arrest the slip or the fall. Nope. That's terrifying. That is so terrifying. And it sounds like it was not her first trek. No, she's just one of she's many. done a lot of mountains so far. But yeah. from what I could understand, yeah. this was her first time up Everest, but she's done the neighboring ones. So it's not her first time. She's very careful usually when she goes on climbs and she's experienced, like extremely experienced for her age. So this was literally a freak accident of just malfunctioning equipment. The worst time. At the worst fucking time. Yeah. The following morning, David and James descended back to their camp where they were tearfully reunited with the rest of their teammates. The group held a search party at the base of the face, but there was no trace of Marty. The group did not succeed in reaching the summit of Everest, but they did help to pioneer a new route on the North Face. On May 18th of 2022, several members of this expedition team gathered to commemorate the climb's 40-year anniversary and pay homage to Marty's memory on her birthday. So, up next... We have probably the most heartbreaking tale I've ever heard of the bodies of Everest, and that is of Francis Arzentiv and Sergei Arzentiv. So Francis Yarbo was born on January 18th of 1958. She went to school and graduated with a master's degree in business. Her professional life was as an accountant in Telluride, Colorado, and she had a yearning for the mountains call. So she was climbing and doing hikes and other things in her daily life. Francis's life took a turn upon meeting one Sergei Arzentiv, a Russian mountaineer known as the Snow Leopard for his achievement of climbing Russia's highest peaks. The two shared a passion for mountaineering and it eventually blossomed into romance, seeing them married in 1992. Francis's climbing career included numerous expeditions, notably ascending Denali's West Buttress, and that's roughly around 6,190 meters in height to its summit, in addition to Europe's Elbrus, which sits approximately 5,642 meters above sea level. She was actually the first United States woman to ski down its slopes, so she's pretty well experienced when it comes to climbing. Now, Francis had a dream of reaching the summit of Everest without the aid of supplemental oxygen, a feat that would distinguish her historically as the first woman to ever do so and the first American woman to ever do so. To be like a yogi. A yogi? Like <laughs> some sort of oxygen master. Like she, she has put her body in a meditative state and somehow still hiked up a hill. I coughed like, too hard yesterday and I was gasping like a fish out of water. <laughs> oh God, I hit my vape for too long and all of a sudden I'm like, <gasps> yeah, it's over. That's good or not. I should probably quit, but oh well. <laughs> my life's like flashing before my eyes. I'm like, I hit the vape too hard. Nope. Uh, <laughs> So one night mm. in 1998, Francis's 11-year-old boy woke up from a terrible nightmare. In it, he'd seen two climbers stuck on the mountain, trapped in a sea of white and unable to escape the snow that seemed to almost be attacking them. Ultimately disturbed by this nightmare, he immediately woke up and began calling out for his mom. 
He thought that it was no coincidence that he'd had such a terrible nightmare on the eve of Francis's departure to Everest. Francis, however, brushed off his fears and insisted that she was going forward with her trip, telling the young boy, I have to do this. In May of 1998, Francis and Sergei began their trek up the mountain. They attempted base camp from the North Col on May 17th and then the mountain's summit the next day, reaching an altitude of 7,770 meters. On May 19th, they both climbed to 8,203 meters, and according to some reports, Sergei reported that they were fine and would start their push to the summit the next day at 1 a.m. However, the next day they started their Everest summit climb, they couldn't make it because their headlamps weren't working, which caused them to stay in Camp 6. Additionally, weather made their attempt more difficult, so they had to stay at Camp 6 for another three days. Now, before you ask, you're probably going, Katie, we didn't cover Camp 6 on the North Coal route. And yeah, you're fucking right we didn't because I got confused with this shit too. I'm like, where the hell is Camp 6 at? So after looking at the map and the elevation rate of where Camp 6 is, I'm presuming it's a part of Camp 4 and it's just simply in a different location because there's so many sparse locations to set up camps up there. So the higher it is, I would presume the higher number it is. Now, without supplemental oxygen, they had to move slowly while hiking through the upper reaches of Everest. Due to both Francis and Sergei being slowed down by lack of oxygen in the death zone, they became fatigued and likely disoriented. Additionally, they had already been in the death zone range for nearly three days at this time. And Francis had horrible frostbite, which made the ascending even more difficult. Oh, God. However, they persevered and reached the summit on May 22nd. However, as they made their way back down the mountain, the two became separated in the dark evening. Wait, so they made it to the summit without oxygen? Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. And then all to just... Just lose it here with whatever you're going to say next, right? Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> oh my god! They were so close. They were so, so close to being it. Right. Francis was now lost somewhere near the top of Mount Everest alone. Another climbing couple passed when Ian Woodall and Kathy O'Dowell were making their own attempt to reach the summit when they came upon a shocking discovery. At first, they thought it was an older, frozen body in a purple jacket. Kathy recalls staring at the body and blinking a few times in disbelief as they stood in the shadow of the first step. The light was still dull, and the body laid about 10 meters away from where she stood and was angled downwards from her. Then, it jerked in a horrible movement. Kathy recalls the body looking like a puppet, which was savagely being pulled by its strings. Oh. The person who was laying on the rocks in front of Kathy was so badly incapacitated that they had spent the night out on the mountain rather than tried to crawl back down. The body was laying in a ghastly inverted V position, and it's suggested by Kathy that it looked as if the climber's spine might have been broken into. Oh, my God. She ended up walking back down and telling Ian, that body's alive. I'm going to go have a look. And it took him a moment to understand what Kathy was saying or even talking about before she insisted, we can't just leave. Oh. Kathy stepped from the trail and walked along the loose shale to the body. They were laying clipped into a line of fixed rope. Their stomach head and legs were dangling down the other side. So they're kind of like folded in half. Upon getting close enough to the figure, Kathy could see that it was a woman. Her skin was milky white and totally smooth. It was a sign of severe frostbite, which made her look like a porcelain doll. Don't leave me, she said. 
her eyes staring up at Kathy, unfocusing pupils, large, dark voids eclipsing her irises. Don't leave me, she muttered again. Kathy recalls how she felt sick, and their fear features mirrored each other's as well with long, dark hair, and Kathy could basically see herself in this woman, and it oh. called into her own conscious, her own mortality on this mountain. Kathy told her, I need to fetch the rest of my team. We have several people here. We will try and help you. I will come back, I promise. To which the woman responded, why are you doing this to me? Now, this woman had no f visible physical trauma and her bizarre position turned out to be a result of complete muscular limpness. She was as helpless as a rag doll. It also looked like someone had clipped her harness to the end of a fixed rope so that she would not slip further down the slope. Then left to go get help. Next to her was a orange bottle of oxygen, presumably of Russian make, along with a mask. The bottle itself was empty. The group was able to pull her straight. Kathy collected her gloves, which had been thrown to the side, her jacket was over her shoulders and her arms were not in the sleeves. Now, Sarah and I discussed this a little bit in the previous episode, but this is paradoxical oh. undressing. Oh, no. And, and it's not uncommon for someone who has severe hypothermia to start discarding clothing due to the sensation of feeling extremely warm. It represents the last effort of the victim to reach hypostasis. And it's usually almost immediately followed by unconsciousness and then ultimately death. Oh, my God. The men tried to replace her clothing on her body, but her hands were swollen masses and her arms were limp. She had no motor control whatsoever. And as Ian tried to put her arms back into the sleeves, she gave no resistance and no assistance. A Sherpa tried to give her some hot juice from his thermos to help warm her back up before him and Ian went to pull her into a sitting position next to a boulder. It took the two strong men several heaves to get her into a sitting position and then a couple more to get her up against the boulder. And they ultimately afterwards doubled over gasping for air because it had exhausted them. And this showed the team what it would actually take to carry her anywhere, let alone down the mountain. Yeah, you can't. Mm -mm. It's so hard to carry a limp body. To begin with, yeah. Oh, that poor, oh, that poor lady. Oh my God. To do something that big and like to just lose it all. Like as soon as you're at like the halfway point. Mm -hmm. We're not even done yet. Because unfortunately, they have no way to give her oxygen. The mask that she had did not fit the bottles that the team was carrying. And while they brought spare bottles, they didn't bring spare masks because you have your own masks. You're just swapping out your tank. Then the other fact is that for oxygen to have any effect on her, she would actually need to be put onto a high flow oxygen tank and stay on it for hours. Meaning one of them would have one of the teammates and the group members would have to go completely off of oxygen to give her a mask and it would exhaust spare supplies that they brought with them very quickly. And unfortunately, until they could establish a real chance of saving her, this was too far great of risk to take. The team had no way of communicating with the outside world. A member did attempt to call base camp for help but the base camp did not have their set switched on, so they didn't get the message. The woman then suddenly stated to Kathy, I am an American. I am an American. And that's when everything starts to kind of click in for Kathy. The American team was still below them, a full day behind them, in fact. Then her mind wandered to two tiny figures she'd seen the day before, at the foot of the first step. One was still, and the other was moving around. Then, 
She remembers a bubbly American woman who had sat in at their ABC camp kitchen tent one night, passing the hours talking while she waited for her husband, a Russian climber by the name of Sergei. Kathy wondered if this could be Francis or how she introduced herself, Fran. After all, the two had no Sherpas and no oxygen when they were summiting. They would not be in radio contact with others on the mountain. However, it didn't fully explain why she had a bottle of oxygen laying next to her, nor did it explain where Sergei had gone. A group of three urbex climbers approached the scene, and Kathy asked them, Will you help us? This woman is dying. We might be able to carry her back down. Would you help? The leader of the three looked down at her reluctantly and stated, We tried to help her yesterday. We left her with oxygen. She is too far gone for help. Oh, my God. I mean, at that point, I think it would be so hard to leave. Now, Ian spoke directly to Frances face to face, hands on her shoulders and stated, you have to help us. If you can help us, we can try to move you down the mountain. If you don't, you are going to die. And he waited for a reaction. But there was none. As far as they could tell, Francis was aware that they were there, but not mentally coherent enough to actually put things together of what was going on. And it was difficult to know what exactly was kind of going on inside her head or even left inside her head at this time. Kathy then noticed Francis's other crampon was a few feet below where she was laying at. And she was going to take a tentative step down the slope and try to go retrieve it. But immediately thought better when the rocks began slipping away from underneath her feet. Oh, so smart yay <laughs> so she watches these rocks tumble to their descent down to the Rongbuk glacier which is nearly 4,300 meters below Kathy could see how someone could have easily lost their balance and gone tumbling down unable to stop the momentum and wondered if this is what had happened to Sergei no Ian and the other Sherpa tried to pull Frances into a standing position, thinking that she could take some of her own weight on her feet, even if she couldn't actually walk fully, just something to give a little bit of stabilization so they can kind of like limp her down. But her legs simply crumpled under her weight. They stayed with Frances for nearly an hour in temperatures of around negative 30 degrees Celsius. They perched precariously on the steep, unstable slope. And Kathy recalls not even being able to stamp her feet to keep herself warm. She then began to feel profoundly cold, and her fingers had gone almost completely numb. And her Mm -hmm. body was racked with shivers, her teeth chattering behind her oxygen mask. Oh, it's time to go. The decision to leave Frances came quietly. Once she stopped talking and seemed to fade into unconsciousness, the group abandoned their summit attempt, feeling the physical drain of the cold and the emotional shattering of watching somebody die in front of them. So before we go forward with updates on Francis, what happened to Sergei? Now, when Sergei reached the camp the following morning after descending from Everest, he found that his wife had not yet arrived. And the realization hit him that she was still somewhere on the mountain, dangerously high on the mountain at that. And he set off to find her. As the Urbex climbers descended to the camp, they saw Sergei on his way back up the mountain carrying medicine and a oxygen tank in a heroic attempt to find her. This is the last time he would be seen alive. Sergei's remains would be found the following year discovered lower on the treacherous mountain by Jake Norton. Evidence suggested that his valiant attempt to rescue his trapped wife ended with him tragically plummeting to his death. In 2007, still haunted by Francis's death 
Ian Woodall led a expedition to give Francis a more dignified burial, along with three other bodies that were on the mountain. As people going up the mountain would regularly stop and take pictures with the bodies. Ian located the body of Francis, wrapped it in an American flag, and the group took the time to move Francis away from the eye of the public and cameras. And from what I could discover, it sounds like she was lowered down the north face or possibly given a ritualistic send off and then pushed over the, the north face. Ian reflects on this experience with a lot can go wrong at 8,600 meters. But... It would be nice to finish one's expedition career by doing something for somebody else, rather than chasing a record or a summit. At least this way, we can give back to everyone and give them some dignity. Oh, that's a traumatizing one. Let's move into Marco Sifridi. Marco Sifridi was one of four children of Felipe and Michelle Sifridi, born May 22nd of 1979. As a child, Marco didn't look in comic books or to movies for heroes. His attention was turned to local skiers and snowboarders who went for larger-than-life descents of impossibly steep slopes. Marco grew up in Western Europe, Mont Blanc to be precise, in Chemoxen, and I'm so sorry if that's mispronounced. I did write it out phonetically. Probably still not right, though. So he's growing up in the area known for the culture of alpinism. And soon he began to aspire for higher things, too. He soon solidified his place as one of the world's best extreme snowboarders and skiers. And in spring of 2001, Marco left with... Himalayan expeditions for the summit of Everest. His hope was to summit and descend on the Horbein Clear by snowboard. But when he got to the mountain, there was hardly any snow on the wind, uh, windswept summit. By leaving in the spring, he had a better chance to summit due to the lighter snow conditions, but those Conditions also made it impossible for him to realize his original plan. However, as climbers moved up the mountain, enough snow accumulated to enable a descent via Plan B, which was the Norton Clear. Marco summited on May 23rd, the day after his 22nd birthday, and dropped in, making turns past the long line of exhausted climbers making their way to the summit. Not far from snowboarding the snowboarding down. Yep, snowboarding down. <laughs> he carried that whole thing up there, too. That's mm -hmm. hilarious. Not far from the summit, though, his binding broke in an extremely high and cold altitude area. Luckily, though, a Sherpa was nearby and was able to help fix it with some bailing wire. And Marco continued down the collier, shredding 1,800 meters on the slopes of 40 to 50 degrees of Mount Everest. Get it. <laughs> he stopped at the north uh he stopped at the North Pole to rest for about an hour before finishing off the last 1000 meters to ABC, less than 4 hours after leaving the summit. Back at the base camp though, a team had already been on the satellite phone and was making calls and it was only a matter of minutes before the story spread to every corner of the snowboarding universe that marco had historically descended off of the highest mountain in the world in the first continuous snowboard descent however marco would return in an attempt to find the holy grail of snowboarding routes and since he was unable to do his original plan, he was now back in September of 2002 to try again. By Thursday of August 22nd of 2002, the team arrived at the ABC at the foot of the North Pole. Marco's previous trip to Everest was made in spring before the monsoon season, which is when there's less snow on the mountain and a majority of ascents to the summit are made because it's just simply easier to do and less treacherous. 
treacherous. Apparently, I can't say that tonight. <laughs> Treacherous. 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 Tetris. It's very Tetris. Marco came after the monsoons and was bridging into those fall months, hoping to take advantage of deeper snow. And when he arrived at ABC, he could hardly believe it was the same place he was in back in 2001, as there's basically nobody else on the mountain. It's completely covered with snow, and you don't see those camps anymore. It's just flat. So, a good time. <laughs> on Friday, August 23rd, 2002, fresh snow had fallen overnight, and Marco sees that the entire north face has been ripped clean from the mountain, exposing the rock below in what he described a, as a festival of avalanches. The following day, the weather falls into a regular pattern of nice days and snowy afternoons, with avalanches ravaging the face daily. Marco would end up racking up a $2,000 foam bill, calling Yanin Gazendar, I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that, Gazendaner, a trusted meteorologist back in, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounced this again, Timonix. But also his girlfriend, Stephanie, and his other family members were being called on the daily by him from his satellite phone. By Wednesday, September 4th, 2002, Marco is in the final days of his climb, with his summit day being Sunday, September 8th. Marco at this point is finding it hard to control his excitement, and he tells the camera that he's basically vlogging to that... The hardest is yet to come, little man. Don't be too happy just yet. On Saturday, September 7th, 2002, Marco makes his way up to Camp 3, officially entering the death zone. And the altitude is taking its toll. Marco is beginning to feel worked, as he described. I bet. <laughs> he called Yan one more time to confirm the forecast for the following day. It was a clear night that night, and presumably it was going to be a clear morning that Sunday with clouds and possible snowfall falling in the afternoon, most likely under 8,000 meters. Jan further tells Marco not to stay too late as the wind is going to kick up in the afternoon, and the next day is completely uncertain for what's in store. Marco responded with a, okay. Merci, adieu, Jan. And Jan says, yeah, we'll talk tomorrow, Marco. Call me when you're down. And Marco responds once again with, yes, but adieu, Jan, adieu. Now, this conversation to untrained ears may seem fairly normal, but avoir is a typical goodbye between friends, not adieu. Adieu is only used when a person never expects to see the other again. So Jan is kind of freaked out by Marco signing off this way. To him, it doesn't sound like the typical see you later between buddies. On Sunday, September 8th of 2002, by 1.30 a.m., the group has left Camp 3. And the Sherpas are beginning an unimaginable task of breaking the trail through chest deep snow at 8,000 meters, pushing for the summit. Oh my God. Like I said, Sherpas are fucking beasts. Okay. They, they are built different. And he's the human version of a, uh, of a plow. <laughs> but They're like, oh, it's easy. We just got to push through. And it's like up to his nipples. He's like, I'm not even cold. <laughs> I'm not even cold. I would be Jesus Christ. By 2.10 p.m., nearly 12 and a half hours in the death zone, the summit is reached. Now, Fruba, a Sherpa, is the first one on the summit, and when Marco arrives, he greets him with a smile. He asks, where are we? Just kind of like trying to edge that out of like, hey, look where we're at. And Marco responds with, at the summit, but tired. 
To which Fruba does a little dance and cheers out, we're at the summit, summit. However, Marco is clearly not sharing the same enthusiasm. And he starts stating, tired, tired, too much snow, too much climbing. Now, Marco, Marco's goal still lays before him in a 3,000 meter track down the Horbin. And by this time, clouds have began to build and form below. His Sherpas are concerned about the conditions as well as the late hour, and they urge Marco not to go through with his plan today. But everything he's worked for in the past year and a half has led him to this moment, and he may never get this chance again. You know, that's okay. He's already done it once. Mm -hmm. You know, he can just say he did it, honestly. There are no cameras. Unless there are. There case. are cameras. Like, oh, we lost the cameras. We lost the cameras. Oh, no. Oh, no. They're with George Mallory and Andrew. Huh. Where, oh, no. Where did the camera go? So I fell in a hole. I couldn't see them once they hit the clouds, but they kept falling. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh. oh, my God. Uh. So oh. at 3 p.m., Marco replaces an empty bottle of oxygen in his back. Uh, backpack or his bag with a fresh one and straps into his snowboard. Fruba helps oh. him with his pack, which in addition to an extra oxygen canister also contains repel gear and a three liter bottle of water. Considering he's about to make one of the most dangerous descents in history, the pack itself holds little, but it should be sufficient to get him down the mountain if everything goes according to plan. It sounds like it's not. <laughs> now, the two bid each other farewell with plans of seeing each other the following day. Marco then drops in, makes a few turns, and waits on the ridge for the Sherpas to catch up. He was breathing hard and shattered by the effort of making turns with the pack on at 8,800 meters. And after probably... Oh, really high. One of the most exhausting 12-hour climbs on the planet. That's a long time to be moving. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, you get oh, to snowboard no. down, but it's like, I just don't have the energy to do that. No. So, he lets the Sherpas pass in front, tells them to watch their rope, and then rides over the back of it as he makes his way left towards the Hornbin Collier. The clouds build up around Marco, and at 3.15ish, he morphs into the soft mountain light of imagination and memory. Now, the Sherpas waste no time getting down from the summit, and they are packing up gear from Camp 3 when they look down below at the North Coal, nearly 1,300 meters below, and they're shocked to see what looks like a man standing up and then slides silently down the mountain which he just drops mm -hmm. oh no which they're like okay a if that was marco how did he get down there so fast because there's no one else on the mountain with them and they're sure they've seen a manifesting apparition now when they get down to the North Coal, where they saw this figure stand up and then slide off the mountain, there are absolutely no snowboard tracks and no other signs of humans. And at this point, they know that Marco is dead. A memorial was held for Marco at Everest Base Camp almost a month later. In attendance were Marco's family and friends, as well as his girlfriend, Stephanie. However, as the chanting of Buddhist priests began to fade and the clouds began to lift from the mountain, the summit cleared visibly, and Marco's tracks were still visible almost one month later. So his snowboard tracks are still up there. Philippe, Marco's father, believes that his son may have gotten tired at the top of the collier and paused to rest, only to succumb to the effects of the altitude and fatigue. 
Others think that he may have gotten caught up in the crux of the collier and his body may still even be there. Others believe that during the descent, he fell while attempting to navigate a difficult section of the mountain and he presumably died on impact. Additionally, with how many avalanches had gone off in the previous days, it's not far-fetched to speculate that when he was traversing across the top of the north face into the collier, an avalanche swept him off the side of the mountain and buried him at the base. However, there is one more rather peaceful theory, and that comes from Marco's sister, who believes that her brother made it down the mountain and chose to live with the local yak herders in Tibet rather than returning to the chaos of Western society. Unfortunately, though, Marco's body has never been found and no trace of him has ever been discovered beyond his initial tracks descending from the mountain that September afternoon. That seems so dangerous, though. Mm -hmm. Like, it's a cool idea. Well, well, I had another one on here that actually went skiing down this mountain. Like, it's not unheard of. People do do this, but I'm like you have a hard enough time getting up and getting down. Why are you going to throw some extreme sport on that just to have the outcome be so much worse? You have the hidden faults and the avalanches and the crevasses, uh, not, not knowing your terrain, which if they're really experienced, I can imagine that they can kind of predict a little bit, you know what the mountain's going to do and what Mm -hmm. it's going to look like. But you know, they're, they're skiers. They're not skiers of Mount Everest or snowboarders of Mount Everest. I guess this guy did it one time, but he was surrounded by people. And I'm guessing it was probably a lot more clear than like September. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's like, oh. So it's like, oof. That one gets me. I, I wonder what happened. I, is he really going to stay afloat, though, like the whole time when they're like having to trudge through it? You know, with their yeah, like, I would be worried because though, it's like honest to God, that happened when I went snowboarding. We were coming down the freaking mountain, and I just buried myself in snow in Winter Park. It happens. Yeah, was it two of my friends? Um, one of them was like, "Hey, check out over here," and I guess they were on the side of a cliff. Um, they've just told me about this, though I wasn't there. But um, and then one of them. Because he's a boy, looks down, says, there's snow, and he jumps into it and ends up, like, to his armpits. And then his friend sees him do it, and he does it. And they're both fine, but, like... (laughs) The snow's rough, especially when it gets super deep. It's like, dude, don't do that. (laughs) Don't play with it. It's like water, but worse. So, we have one more, and that is David Sharp. Now, David Sharp was an experienced and accomplished mountaineer who had climbed some of the world's tallest mountains, including Cho Oyo in the Himalayas. David had a philosophy, no supplemental oxygen, as he valued climbing at its most traditional and elemental form. David believed that reaching the summit without artificial aid was a more genuine accomplishment testing the limits of human endurance and adaptation to extreme environments. This also likely reflected David's desire for self-reliance. In his 2002 ascent of Cho Oya, the world's sixth highest mountain peak, he did it without oxygen, and the expedition leader actually noted that he was definitely the strongest climber on their team. Now, David's first Everest expedition occurred in 2003 with a team led by a fellow British climber. During his ascent, he developed frostbite, leading him to turn around just below the second step, just 200 meters from the summit, and go back to camp. And he eventually lost some toes due to this as well, which he blamed on the cheap boots that he was wearing. Despite not reaching the summit itself, David was exceptionally strong and well acclimated as a mountaineer. And in 2004, David joined a European team, and this time he ventured high into the mountain's death zone. And it was reported that he 
and the expedition leader were constantly at odds because David preferred to solo climb and he didn't want to use supplemental oxygen. Once again, during this climb, David failed to summit, but he was close at 8,500 meters. This was the climb that reinforced his desire to climb Everest without guides and supplemental oxygen on his next attempt. In 2006, David decided that he was going to make a solo attempt on Mount Everest and told people, if I don't do it this time, I'm not coming back. David arranged his climb through a Nepal-based agency called Asia Trekking, although some articles will also note it as being Asian Trekking, and he opted for the base service package, which provided him with a permit, logistical support up to the advanced base camp, and a limited supply of oxygen. The booking through Asian Trekking or Asia Trekking cost about $6.2,000, which is considerably lower than the $40,000, which is what top Western companies charge to summit Everest with a team. By late April, David was at Everest Base Camp, acclimating himself and preparing for his summit attempt. David began the final push from the North Coles higher camps late on May 13th of 2006, and the details surrounding his final hours remain unclear. David did not carry a radio or satellite phone. Direct observations of his progress were sparse, and there was no record of him reaching the summit. However, there are some climbers who believe they saw someone fitting David's description near the summit area, and some speculate that he may have reached it, or once again nearly reached it, before encountering difficulties and being forced to descend. On May 14th of 2006, David was descending the mountaintop when he sought refuge in Green Boots Cave, an overhanging cave of limestone near the summit trail that was named after the presence of a frozen body with bright green boots that had been placed there or had fallen there, which we'll come back to green boots in a future episode. I know some of you are probably like, wait a minute, where is he? Why didn't you talk about him? He is part of the 1996 Everest incident, which will be its own episode. Now, this area is still well within the death zone. It's extremely cold, and climbers reported seeing David huddled in the cave wearing his top-of-the-line millet mountaineer boots, and some thought that he was simply resting or already deceased at the time. A team of Turkish climbers passed David in the early hours of May 15th as the group of climbers reached the famous limestove cave where green boots marked the way. They got a nasty shock when they saw that the long dead mountaineer had company. The group described him as being alive but in a dire state suffering from severe frostbite and oxygen depletion. Efforts to assist him were minimal, as the team was constricted by their own oxygen supply and were also being racked by the harsh conditions in the death zone. According to the group, David was seated with his arms wrapped around his knees, icicles hanging from his lashes, and he didn't respond to any other calls or shouts. Uh, The climbers believed that he had already gone comatose, and they didn't radio down for help. Instead, they left him there. 20 minutes later, another group came upon David in the cave. Again, the group shouted at him to get up and move on, but without saying another word, David waved them off. Members of a commercial expedition led by Russell Bryce which included double amputee climber Mark Inglis, encountered David. They noticed that he was in dire condition, but felt unable to render effective aid due to the critical state he was in and their expedition priorities. The two noted that David was too far gone to really be able to do anything. When climber Maximi Chania, uh, and I'm so sorry if I mispronounced that last name, and his team found David. 
He was still in the cave while they were descending from the summit. And unfortunately, at this point, they know that there is nothing they can do. However, I'm willing to abandon the man whose face was turning black with frostbite. Maxime sat down with him and prayed until he was forced to leave or risk his own life to stay. During this, he had the radio on and was basically messaging for help down at the base camps below. And unfortunately, the people that were hearing these radio messages could only sit and weep knowing that there was nothing they can do. David spoke his last words to a Sherpa who stopped and tried to help him. They were, my name is David Sharp. I'm with Asian Trekking and I just want to sleep. David's body remains on Mount Everest, although he was relocated from Green Boots Cave, and eventually Sherpas took uh, David's body to a nearby cliff's edge and pushed it over the side onto the north face. In the wake of David's death, the mountaineering community had been forced to confront difficult questions, as many climbers proceeded to trek to the top without offering assistance to David. It is well documented that over 40 climbers passed David on their way up and down the mountain that day. And this raised questions about ethics of climbing, the responsibility climbers have to one another, and their priorities when it comes to commercial expeditions. David spoke to his mother prior to leaving for Everest for the last time. And during this call, he reassured her not to worry about him because, and I quote, you are never on your own. There are climbers everywhere. It, it really starts raising the questions of who who is to be responsible in aiding someone else. Mm -hmm. um, especially in that situation. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, with Francis, I, they all stopped to help, but really it was to no prevail and to only... Late. Yeah, endanger themselves. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure people passed by her. Um, yeah. But. Well, I remember when I first uh, ever, like, listened to, I think it was my favorite murderers coverage of Bodies of Everest. They discussed how, and I couldn't find it anywhere, but apparently, according to them, with them basically sitting down on the mountain's edge and it wouldn't be far-fetched to go this way either francis had basically frozen to the mountainside there was nothing else that they could no, do yeah david well, did no, the same was, thing so far gone yeah david did the same thing so when he sat down he froze to the ground you can't you can't you can't stop uh <laughs> oh god that would be probably one of the most difficult things you would do in your life Mm -hmm. Um, just as as a person, as an ooey gooey blood water meat filled creature, you can't you can't go up there. You're not supposed to go up there. I think that's why it's that the trek up Everest is so endearing. But at the same time, I mean, this thought might not be looked at kindly, but you can't hold other people responsible for climbers oh, that decide to go up by themselves without a Sherpa. If you if you get yourself in, I strongly believe you should you should very well be able to get yourself out. Yeah. Unfortunately, it, even if there are people around you. I um, think the controversy it, it happens would be... of there was some time and some wiggle room in there that people could have helped, but they were so summit madness hungry that they just went past him. I mean, you you can present it that way. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, you still have to think this is in the death zone. There's one third of oxygen available. Everything mm -hmm. we weighs like 10 times more than it usually does. You're struggling to get up by yourself. Look at Francis and them moving her. It was a struggle that left them breathless and they barely moved her a couple of feet. I think the common denominator so far is just exhaustion. Mm hmm. That's a very common way just, that people go on Everest. Oh. It's just exhaustion. You just get too tired. 
and this this guy this guy could have done it i believe he could have mm -hmm. um something stopped him who knows what um i i mean we'd all i think any person that saw that happening would want to be the one to help. I think that the even even the more selfish people out there, they see something like that happening, they want to be the one to help. Mm -hmm. But when you're that high up there, you you're definitely putting your own life at risk. Yeah. Every time you stop, every time you slow down. And that's something that they discuss too in a lot of articles is that these climbers come in knowing what they're signing up for. It's not like they're coming in You'd blind so. to this. You'd hope so. <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, oh. there might be a few people that go in blind. They're like, where are we going for vacation, sweetie? And he's like, Mount Everest. And they're like, the base. And Mount they're like, no, Everest, the top. <laughs> We're going all the way to the top, darling. Aren't you ready? She's like, I have the shakes from not drinking enough this morning. Tina, I can't go <laughs> Honey, all the way up mean? to the top. We can't climb Everest, Peter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. When they eat that guy's kid. <laughs> oh, Jesus. That episode hurt my feelings. <laughs> that episode hurt my feelings, too. <laughs> oh, God. We ate somebody. <laughs> you know, we ate somebody. <laughs> oh, my God. They're, like, going up the mountain to find their son. It's like, uh, uh maybe not. Um, <laughs> maybe don't do that. Doesn't sound like a good oh. idea. I mean, it's funny, but, like, because Dahmer party stuff. But, like, mm -hmm. I don't think you could eat somebody. Like, I don't think you could start a fire up there, to be honest. I think it would be very difficult. There's not enough oxygen, too. Oh, no. No, no. no. If, if you did, it would be a very low-laying fire, and it'd be gasping for air, too. Yeah. Oh, God. I brought an oxygen tank for the fire. Um. <laughs> I mean, that would be a way to do um, it, is just, like, Bunsen burn it. Spray it with oxygen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But anyways, Sarah, that is the bodies of Everest for now. Like I said, we will be coming back in the future. I need a break from this area. I need to get off the mountain. So in the Do future, we'll come back to the 1996 Everest incident because there are so many people that perished during that. And a lot of you might be going, where's Rob Hall? Where's... Uh, Teshwing Paljor, which would be Green Boots, and all these other people that perished. And that's all on one singular day of Everest. So we'll come back to that later. Thank you again for listening to Spattered. Please make sure to follow the show on Facebook and Instagram at Spattered Podcast or on Twitter at Spattered Pod. Be sure to follow and rate the show with five stars on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or wherever you get your podcasts from. If you're watching on YouTube, please make sure to hit that like button, ring that notification bell, and smash that follow button. As always, if you have a story request, any questions, or are interested in sponsoring the show, please email me at spatteredpodcast at gmail.com. Spattered is a true crime podcast hosted by Caitlin Gardner. The research and edits for this episode today were done by Caitlin Gardner. All the music for the show comes from Lucio Cardenas, James Hansen, and Caitlin Gardner. A special thanks to our guest co-host this week, Sarah Ray. We'll see you next time. Stay safe out there. And remember, the truth is always in the blood. And before you go, please make sure to head over to carrygirlgear.com and check out the merch available for Spattered Podcast. We have new spooky season material, so get over there. Link tree is in the show notes below.